are concerned and not be so distraught uh, most of the time. It enabled me to feel I was participating meaningfully in um, my recovery or my aspirations for recovery. And that's important because you've got to take personal responsibility for your own um, you know, outcomes really. You know, it makes me think if I can control this and I can control that, um, you know, I feel like I'm on track and I feel positive about the outcomes. I think it's very important that the person with the disease is part of the team dealing with the disease. And by having a positive attitude, that may mean simply taking an interest in what's happening, being aware of what's happening, uh, being involved in the decisions about what's happening, can, can help them. There are some limited things that people can do, but as I've, I've, as I've said before, people can eat well while they can, they can exercise within limitations while they can, all these things can help their outcome. Often in amongst all the other information that people are given when they first present with one of these conditions is they may be asked to take part in a, in a clinical trial, in, in a study. Um, we are generally very keen on clinical studies because they firstly increase our knowledge. The reason we can treat some of these diseases and, the, and that we have quite good results is because in the past people have been entered into studies which compare one treatment with another to see if one, a new treatment perhaps is better than an older treatment. And these trials will always have been approved by an ethics committee in this country. Um, they will be valid scientific questions that are being asked and often will give us access to drugs and to treatments that we don't have access to otherwise. And so people have absolute right not to take part in trials, but in general terms people who are involved in trials uh, tend to have good outcomes. You know, people shouldn't be alarmed at the possibility that one of the first things that might be asked after discussing the diagnosis and the options, one option may be taking part in a clinical trial, and that's often a good thing. I think one of the greatest fears when diagnosed with a serious illness is that is, is what it means in terms of symptoms of pain, um, how serious the, the, the drugs we're going to use are. Often people are very concerned about the possibility of nausea, vomiting, losing their hair with chemotherapy. And these are real issues for some of the conditions that we treat and some of the drugs that we use. However, the, the truth is often less scary or less worrying uh, than the reality. We have very good ways of controlling many of those side effects and problems. While we can't predict for any individual patient how many problems they're going to have, uh, in general terms, most of the side effects of the drugs and most of the problems caused by the by the disease itself can be overcome. We've got very good ways of controlling things like nausea, good ways of controlling pain. Um, hair loss is an issue for some people, but we generally can provide wigs or appropriate uh, support in that way. There is very little evidence that complementary treatments in general are helpful in terms of actual treating the condition. And I get a little concerned if people are suggesting they take complementary or alternative treatments rather than the medications that we believe work in these diseases as an alternative. I, on the other hand, I have no problem with people taking complementary and alternative things in addition to what we do, and we often like to see what they're taking. Whatever people are taking, whatever they want to take, that we discuss that with between the health professionals and themselves. It's, it's important that we work in an open climate. Um, it's, it's very difficult to treat people if they are taking things that we don't know about or they're not taking things that we think they're taking. And if they don't want to take them, that's entirely their choice, but it does make decision making easier if we know. The diagnosis of leukaemia or some of these serious blood disorders can turn someone's life upside down. They have to stop work immediately. They have to leave home and, and travel to a centre, sometimes several hours away by car. and their families have to cope with that. And there is good support. There are, all, all the treatment centres have good social workers. We have psychologists, there's the Leukaemia and Blood Foundation. Uh, the the centres that have patients travelling from other areas will have appropriate accommodation. And, and so, although this is a huge upheaval, there are ways of minimising the impact uh, and trying to allow families to cope with this change in their lives. Um, most centres we try and encourage 
patients' families to visit them as much as possible. Um, we try to allow people to get home to their hometown as much as possible between treatments if that's appropriate. And so there's a lot of support and, and I think involving the family in, in the process, the decision making and the help agencies that I've mentioned will minimise the impact or, or try to minimise the impact on people's lives. But there's no question these diseases are a major disruption in people's lives. I think for patients when they are well, because there are periods during treatment for some of these conditions where they will feel unwell, but when they're well to nourish themselves well, uh, to, to get up and get out where possible. I think some people can spend long periods of time in a hospital ward and when they're well and when they can, we encourage people to get out if, the, if that's appropriate uh, and to get up and get dressed. Um, and if, I think it's the worst thing to do is to curl up and face the wall. Um, some people are very sick and that's the, best, you know, the only thing they can do, but in general terms, uh, trying to carry on with their life and, and uh, as much as is possible is appropriate. And for those people with conditions which don't require long periods in hospital, I think living with these diseases can be very difficult um, and, and trying to get on with their lives. I mean, people liken treatment of, of cancer to a journey and it's a very, sometimes a very arduous and difficult journey. And the best way of coping with that is to have support and to have help. And that's where family members, friends uh, can come into this. And I think trying to make that journey on one's own can be very difficult. And, and the more support uh, and help from family and friends, the better. Your life after cancer is a peculiar thing. It, it, uh, it's almost, um, it's a big thrill, but it's almost an anticlimax at the same time, you know. Very often uh, you've been in and out of the ward for a long period of time, months at least, sometimes years. Um, you, you've grown to have a, almost a second family within the hospital. Um, people really struggle sometimes uh, to gain their sense of normality and, and feel out of sorts and find it difficult. They talk about this new normal that you have to discover as a cancer survivor and it's very real. Fear of recurrence is, is natural and it's very, very common. Uh, and certainly, you know, once you stop getting treatments and once you're back in your home setting and whatnot, um, you know, you are looking forward to having your hair grow back or whatever and, you, uh, and your weight come back on or off or whatever it is. Um, um, but, um, but fear of occurrence is real. I think having that sort of positive intent um, in terms of going forward and having a plan to do it really, really helped me. In communicating that with your family as well so they understand where you're at and, and what you're going through, how you're feeling, and so they can carry on the journey of healing with you rather than sort of being shut out and you feeling that you need to to sort of get your life back on track and you know you, you need to open up to your family or friends people around you it'll help both of you there's no question it can be scary you go from an environment where you're surrounded by health professionals your temperatures being monitored constantly if you have anything wrong you simply push the buzzer or you go and talk to the nurses and it, and stuff happens and then suddenly you're at home and that's all gone and not only are you at home and that's all gone and it's something you've looked forward to for a long time, you have to deal with the fear the disease may not have, have been cured completely and it may come back and that's a very difficult adjustment. And I think the, the key thing is to be aware of that, that this long sought goal of getting home and finishing treatment is sometimes quite a letdown. I think people can be quite um, deflated by that and I think if, if one's aware of that it, it can help to minimise that, that you are aware it's going to be scary and it's going to be a bit difficult getting home, although that's what you've been aiming for all that time. The recovery is often a stepwise process and you know some weeks you're going to feel worse than you did a week ago, and, but it's the long-term improvement, so it's, it's like a series of steps. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm.